The following interview contains descriptive and sometimes detailed events of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Some of the material that is shared in this interview may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, I'm Chris from HC Media, and today I'm talking with Rich Narashevitz, who was the former ferry captain in New York during the events of September 11, 2001. Rich's interview is part of a much larger set of interviews that were conducted with other 9-11 first responders uh, and others who were also involved that day, uh, various firefighters from here in Haverhill and police as well, uh, and also other individuals that were uh, just a part of the whole process, uh, either during the days of 9-11 or there in the aftermath as well. The video that is being produced uh, will actually be premiered on September 11th, 2016, here in Haverhill at the Firefighters Museum. Uh, Rich, thank you for joining me today uh, via phone all the way from New York. Uh, Why don't you just first tell us a little bit about who you are and give us a brief introduction as to, you know, what led you to your role as ferry captain. Okay, my name is Rich Narashevitz. I am a captain in New York Harbor. On 9-11, I was a ferry captain that did nine round trips, rescued over 4,000 people, rescued many, many gravely injured people on that day. I got, I started in the maritime industry as a messman on a container ship going from Japan and Europe to the East Coast. Uh, I am an, I am a captain now, worked my way up through the ranks. I'm a captain now on an oil tanker in New York Harbor which refuels anything and everything on the waterfront that can be reached by oil tanker and not by truck. We do ships, tugs, barges, and ferries. And uh, I am in the Merch Marine, and I started when I was 18, right out of high school, and I'm still employed. This is my 36th year. On 9-11, I was discharging passengers at uh, Pier 11 Wall Street in Manhattan, and I seen a plane come over the horizon over my left side. And I was looking and I wasn't paying attention. I figured the plane was going over the buildings. And I finished discharging passengers and I backed out of the slip going to my next ferry stop at East 34th Street in Manhattan. And as I was backing out, the deckhand came up and said, a plane just hit the tower. And I said, say that again? He said, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. I said, are you sure it's not a movie or something? He goes, no, a plane just hit the tower. Right then and there, I know, I said, I never seen that plane come out of the other side of the buildings. So what I did is I took the ferry and went right around the tip of Manhattan to the other side on the Hudson River, and I'm looking, and the plane sliced right through the tower. And I'm looking, and it, it was red hot, red, glowing hot, and that was burning jet fuel. And I'm looking, and I'm going, I couldn't believe I was just looked at it one second, and I grabbed the microphone for the PA system on the boat, and I said, okay, this is the captain speaking now. You are under my authority. I am responsible for your safety while you're on this vessel. We're not going back to East 34th Street. We're going back to Pier 11 and pick up anybody and everybody we could. And by the time we got, like two minutes later, we got back into the slip, it was complete mayhem. It was thousands of people running down to the uh, ferry slips uh, because there was no way other out of Manhattan. The only way to get out from downtown Manhattan at that time was on a ferry. And uh, we just kept loading people, loading people. There were thousands of people running down to the ferry docks, and we loaded people. My first trip uh, from then, I went back to uh, Highlands, New Jersey, and discharged passengers and went back to Manhattan. And by that time, when I was in the slip, the first ferry, I mean, the first tower collapsed right in front of us. We were caught in that dust cloud we couldn't get out when the first tower collapsed in front of us it was uh, like a hundred sonic booms it was so loud uh i went deaf i couldn't hear nothing and then came that dust cloud it was like a like a a, a sonic boom the whole furry shook and went from side to side in the furry slip then the uh the toxic dust 
the dust cloud, uh, there was all asbestos and burning insulation and everything. It started to come into the air conditioning ducts uh, on the ferry. And I was on, a, I was up on a bridge. I was by myself. It came into the pilot house. So what I did is I took my shirt off. I wet it down with bottles of water and tied it around my face. And then I, I got the engineer on the radio and I told him to shut down all the ventilation, everything. Cause we were, what was, we were sucking that all in into the ventilators for the engine room and the passenger spaces on the ferry. And it was just complete mayhem after then. It was just thousands and thousands of people every trip running down, running down to the ferry docks. And then I was shuttling them back down to uh, Highlands, New Jersey, which is in Sandy Hook Bay. My first trip, I was completely overloaded. I could have went to jail because I didn't have life jackets for everybody, but I couldn't stop the people from running down to the dock. So I loaded to safety, and then I went back, and I went back down to Highlands, New Jersey. And then from the next for the next 28 hours, that's what we did. Wow, that's that's really scary. So, do you have any particular people or persons or situations that day? I know there was a lot, but Anything stand out in your mind as significant? Well, there was a, uh, a couple of different things. Uh, I was going back to Manhattan. I was going between Governor's Island and Brooklyn, New York. It's called the Buttermilk Channel. It's a shipping channel. And on our way up, we had to fish out this... I, this, I think this lady was... She was 27, 28 years old. She was six months pregnant. She jumped in the water and tried to swim from tip of Manhattan across to Brooklyn. We had to stop, put her all, put over our man overboard ladder and pick her up and bring her and bring her up. Then we picked this other guy up out of the water because he tried to swim too, and I think he just completely lost it. Once we got him on board, he tried to fight everybody. So what we did is we just threw a cargo net on him and threw him into a bunch of seats. But there was just thousands and thousands of people pushing and surging and surging to get on the boats. It was just complete mayhem. You know, 9 o'clock at night, when I pulled in again up to East 34th Street, it was like giant stadium in New York. It was like there were thousands of people came out of nowhere and rushed down the street and down a ramp and got on a boat. I guess they were afraid they just hit buildings, you know? Wow. That, I mean, kudos to you for, you know, and your team for – holding it together and, and being able to pull, pull through that. I, I don't know if it, if, if, if anyone would have been able to do that. So thank you for everything you've done. Yeah, um, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. You know, it's just, and that's just one of the, one of the many aspects on the boat. I mean, you know, yeah. the, one of the times I pulled into Pier 11, I think it was like about 10 o'clock at night and I pulled in and you got to remember now, Manhattan is completely black. There ain't a light on, nothing, nothing. And we pulled into the slip, the deckhands put the ramp down, and I turned on the spotlight, and I put it on a ramp to see if anybody was coming, that they would see the ramp, right? And in the beam of the spotlight, inside the beam of the spotlight, was a complete whiteout. That's how much asbestos and insulation and everything else and newspaper that burnt on fire that was still swirling in the air it was like a complete whiteout at night coming past the searchlight it was still like a blizzard and i put out the ramp and the next thing you know people came out of nowhere by the hundreds to get on a ferry wow i can't even imagine that that's unbelievable well we we were we were just going anywhere and everywhere we can in manhattan from the west side of manhattan to the tip of manhattan pier 11 Wall Street to East 34th Street, anywhere we could jockey for a position to pick up people. I came around the tip of Manhattan. First, I went to Pier 11 Wall Street, and we loaded people there, and I backed out. We went to the west side of Manhattan. I see these, these ladies over, over a distance. I see these ladies with strollers. They're at the Battery Park seawall. So the ferry I had was it, it handled like an Apache helicopter. It was all jet drive. I made a hard right to the starboard side, and I went and I nosed up along the seawall, and we were telling them to drop the babies, just drop the babies, leave the carriages there, drop the babies, we'll catch them. And there were some passengers helping us, and they were dropping the infants to us, and then the ladies climbed over the wall, and we were helping them down onto the ferry. So we, we rescued those babies, those infants. I, I lost count how many number, and then the ladies climbed over. 
Then we went back up to East 34th Street on the East River, and we, we were completely loaded in about 90 seconds. People came running down, and I backed out of the slip, and I see this lady running down the street trying to get onto the ferry, and we had backed out. And, I, and she was standing there by herself. I took the ferry and I went right back in the slip. She ran down. She got on board and I backed out. And we went to Highlands, back to Highlands, New Jersey. I'm still friends with her today. You know, she's still thanking me for coming in. But I couldn't leave that lady stranded there. And then uh, towards the nighttime, uh, they told us that there was a good chance that we were going to be the morgue. We were going to carry some pretty... Um, some pretty mangled people, uh, you know, people that were really in bad shape who were cut by shrapnel. Uh, we had this one lady who was, who had a paper cut. She got hit by shrapnel, a piece of steel from her left shoulder down her back across the spine to her right hip was like one big paper cut. She had no blouse on. She had no bra on. She was wrapped around in like these sheets and she had to stand up straight against the wall, the bulkhead, on the ferry, so she wouldn't bleed. But there were people, we had people who were mangled, pieces of their legs missing, uh, pieces of their arms missing, uh, people with burnt, clothes burnt on, their, on, on them, their suits, uh, they were just completely burnt, uh, pieces of it. Uh, they were they were afraid they hit any they hit everywhere until a ferry showed up and they came running out. Uh, a couple of people on the ferry expired. We were carrying the body bags and the pretty mangled people the people who were severely injured firemen everybody civilians everybody from Manhattan uh, Pier 11 Wall Street Manhattan to 52nd Street in Brooklyn because there was no more room whatsoever in any of the hospitals in New York. So we had two priests on board just in case, you know, uh, they had to give less rights to, to some of the people. And from what I remember, they had to. Uh, a couple of people expired in that short transit from Manhattan to Brooklyn. Uh, and we just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Jeez. I'm curious, and this is this is sort of a question that was posed to you, but... Um, what if what has affected you? Let's talk about short term, like you know, in the days and weeks after, but also fifteen years later. What what is sort of stays with you, and, and how has this changed your professional and personal life? Well, uh, I mean, I go past it two or three times a day. I crisscross New York Harbor six, seven times a day, refueling everything. On the, on the New Jersey side, on the Brooklyn side, on the Manhattan side. I mean, I could tell, like I said, I could tell you as if it happened yesterday. Uh, I remember everything. Uh, and uh, personally affected me, I, I knew a lot of our, our, our ridership, a lot of people who rode our, our ferries. I just didn't see no more. And like two weeks later, they would have like a memorial service for them. I would look at the paper, the local paper, and uh, I would see their pictures. Now I'm more vigilant than I ever was. I always was vigilant. You know, now I'm more even vigilant. If I see something, I call it in. I'm always double-checking, triple-checking everything. What if something happened? Where would I go? What, what, uh, you know, what, what would be a safe haven for myself and my crew on a boat? How would I get home? Uh, you know, I'm constantly thinking about that. Wow. At what point did your rescue operation change? I know you mentioned a little bit it became you were transporting bodies. Um, is that something that kind of was a role reversal at that point? Yeah. At, at that point, when they told us, they said, you know, they just told us real briefly, they said, look, you're going to be, you're going to be transporting some severely injured and mangled people. And, um, it may not what you want to see. So if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. I said, don't even ask me that question. I'm doing it anyway. And then I asked the rest of the crew, and their response was the same. My crew stayed with me. They said, we're in. We're in to the end. And that was it. And we just took off, and we went right back right back to Manhattan. But I, I asked for two priests. I said, you have to put at least two priests on these boats. 
in case somebody needs last rites, because if that's what you're telling me, uh, real quick, I told him, if that's what you're telling me, then I need two priests. And there were two priests, at, actually, there were two priests at the dock, at the largest triage uh, for decontaminating everybody, and that was in Highlands, New Jersey, and I asked those two priests to come with me, and they jumped right on the ferry, and we took off. Me, I, I, like I said, I could tell you that as if it happened yesterday. A couple of guys that I work with, they remember nothing that day. They completely blacked out. They remember coming to work, being part of uh, my crew or one of the other ferries that we had, and uh, they remember nothing. They remember, like, making a few trips, getting in the car, starting the car, and going home, remember nothing. They completely blacked out. Seems to be kind of a, a way to cope with it, I suppose. I'm curious because I'm, I'm editing this piece, so I, I have a couple of thoughts of my own to kind of question you on. One is, um, this is probably a really difficult question to ask, and you didn't have any time to, to prepare for it, but I, I'm curious. Um, amidst all the horror that happened that day and, and the weeks to come afterwards and the years to come, really, is there anything you can think of that was positive that came out of it? Well, a lot of people sent me letters thanking us for coming back. You know, uh, they knew we didn't have to. We just didn't make one trip. We went back to New Jersey and say, screw this. I'm not going back. You know, we went back and we got them because that was the right thing to do. I just stayed focused and kept going and kept going and kept going. I lost count that 4,000 people that we rescued that day. I, we just stopped clicking after a while. Anything positive, I'm, I mean, you know, we stayed together. The whole crew stayed together. We put up the Freedom Tower, showed them that, you know, we're still, you know, we're still alive and kicking. We're not done yet, and it'll be a long time before we are done. What does the phrase never forget mean to you? The phrase never forget means that never forget the people, the innocent people who perished that day. Not only the policemen, not only the firemen. Just every or, everyday ordinary people that were there just going to work. In the mornings, you always got to remember, th there was always like delivery people, people from foreign countries that came over here who just got jobs delivering coffee and sandwiches and stuff in the morning up in the, in the tower. They died also. People who were on their way to work. Just, just every, everyday ordinary people who lost their lives who never, never knew what happened, you know, and they, they were never found. Uh, I know a few people that I know, friends of mine, that they had relatives, brothers and sisters that were never found. Uh, I, I know a couple of people that they had to go and identify them. They found a piece of their body, like the, the upper torso or the bottom torso and one leg or a, a bone fragment. To, I personally think you'll never, never, never really know how many people died that day. There's still body parts and fragments that they haven't identified yet from DNA. That's still people. Those, those were still people they don't account for that are still, the numbers are still climbing, the people that can't identify. And not only that, the people that are dying. People are dying from different cancers who were there, bladder cancer, men having breast cancer, thyroid cancer, lung cancer, brain cancer, leukemia, everything associated that you could name of that was, you know, uh, associated from breathing in that, um, that toxic cloud, just being there, you know what I mean? Now they're all dying. So, I mean, I, I never forget, never forget what happened, that we were attacked on our soil. Innocent people died, and it was, the, it, in my words, it was done by a bunch of cowards. It was done by a bunch of cowards. And, uh, you know, that's the way I look at it. I never forget what happened that day. A lot of people, it's just like, you know, society today has changed. People just turn around and say, you know, yeah, it's another day in history, so what? Uh, what about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? No, we're talking about the biggest attack on American soil. Besides Pearl Harbor, this was the biggest attack on U.S. soil. And that's just the way I look at it. I completely agree. Well, Rick Nereshevitz, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us and, and tell us your story. It's quite a story. And, uh, you know, I, I feel honored to to be the one to hear it and to be able to share it with, with uh, our listeners and, and eventually our viewers. So thank you very much. Yeah, okay, no problem. No problem. It's my pleasure, you know. Good Thanks, deal. Rick. Take care. All right, take, take care of yourself. Bye-bye. 
So there you have it. Rick Narashevitz, uh, ferry captain uh, for 9-11. Uh, great guy, great interview. Definitely be looking for the full video of the 9-11 memorial, which is coming here to Haverhill. Uh, it's going to be uh, unveiled on September 11th at the Firefighters Museum. And uh, you can catch uh, this video. It'll be airing on Haverhill Community TV, Channel 22. Also be available on our website, uh, HaverhillCommunityTV.org. We'll definitely be splashing it on the different social medias that we are on as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that that was quite a story, and I, and I hope that you were able to um, remember the uh, the dark days of 9/11, but how it changed the world and. Um, just uh, kind of get an inside look at, at somebody's story 15 years later. So thank you all for listening and have a great evening.